This is going to be 2 Kings chapter number 4. <clears throat> and Elijah in this chapter is a great picture of Jesus Christ and that he can help you with your debt problem. The saying is that Jesus paid a debt he did not owe because we owed a debt that we could not pay. And that's a really good phrase and saying there. The Lord is going to do a miracle with Elisha in this chapter. And Elisha is going to make sure that the woman does not run out of oil. Just like Jesus Christ was able to keep the food supply going when he fed the 5,000 in Mark 6. Uh, the Lord can take a little bit and do incredible things with just a little. Consider Moses' rod. Consider Samson's jawbone. Shamgar's ox goat. And so on and so forth. And so let's look at 2 Kings 4 and verse 1. It said, Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elijah, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead. And thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord. And the creditor has come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. You see, this woman can't pay the creditor, and the creditor is about to come and take the two things she loves the most she, because she can't pay off the debt. The creditor's about to come take her two sons to make them to be bondmen or slaves. And her husband, he's dead. He did fear the Lord. And Proverbs 9.10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You can get help much easier when you fear the Lord. Her husband feared the Lord. He was a son of a prophet. And Elijah is going to be helping a godly family here in this chapter. He doesn't want her two sons to be bondmen, so he's going to tell her how to get empty vessels and get these vessels full of oil. And we know oil is a picture of the Holy Spirit in the Bible, and our bodies are vessels that are indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. And we know we are always indwelt by the Holy Spirit, but we aren't always filled with the Holy Spirit. So when when we are living for the flesh and in bondage to it, we aren't living what you would call a spirit-filled life. But with that being said, look at verse 2. And before we look at verse 2, I want to say uh, this topic for this chapter will be making room. You need to make room for some things. But 2 Kings 4 and verse 2, And Elijah said unto her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me. What hast thou in the house? And she said, Thine handmaid hath not anything in the house, save a pot of oil. So Elijah reminds her just to take what she presently has, a pot of oil, and use it. You don't need a bunch of stuff to live for God. You don't have to have a whole bunch of money to live for God. You don't have to have a whole bunch of talent to live for God. Just use what you currently have. God will take you and use what you currently have. When you help someone out, you can help them with what they currently have. In Hebrews 13, 5, it says, Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have. And all that she had was a pot of oil. And if you're saved and you don't have a dime to your name, then you are rich and don't even know it. I mean, your body's the temple of the Holy Ghost. And if oil is a picture of the Holy Spirit, then the pot of oil can illustrate you. In 2 Kings 4, 3 and 4, it says, Then he said, Go borrow the vessels abroad of all thy neighbors. Even empty vessels borrow not a few. And when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons, and shalt pour out into all those vessels, and thou shalt set aside that which is full. So when you get saved, the Lord puts his Holy Spirit in you to show that he's serious about saving you. It's a guarantee. The Holy Spirit seals you into the day of redemption. Then, through spending time with the Lord in prayer, in the Bible, daily living for him, and putting down the flesh, you can be filled with the Spirit. When you pour yourself in the Word, the Lord pours Himself into you. And you get transformed by the renewing of your mind. You get filled. Ephesians 5.18 says, And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. So it's wrong to be drunk with wine, correct? So... 
With that being said, it's also wrong to not be filled with the Spirit. The verse said, don't be drunk with wine. But the verse also said, be filled with the Spirit. So it, that kind of shows you that it's just as wrong to not be filled with the Spirit as it is to be drunk with wine. Now that we've got that established, we know that you're sealed with the Holy Spirit. We know that we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So fill your, get yourself filled with the Holy Spirit by daily living for the Lord, doing the things you need to do. And now you can go help other Christians get filled. Pour yourself into them and fill them up. And I know this isn't a perfect illustration, but this woman's children were about to become bondmen. They were about to become slaves because she couldn't pay the debt, right? So she's going to fill up empty vessels with oil, sell them, and then use the money to pay the debt. So the best way to not become bondmen to the flesh is to pour yourself into other people. And this pays off. Pouring yourself into others. Galatians 5.13. If you look at Galatians 5.13, it says, For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. Romans 15.2-3. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification, for even Christ pleased not himself. So this certain woman borrowed the vessels from other people. They did her a favor. In a way, the people you pour yourself into are doing you a favor, even though it seems you're just doing them a favor. For example, if you have students that allow you to teach them the Bible, they're doing you a favor. They keep you accountable. They keep your mind sharp. They keep your focus off of yourself. And the best way to get happy in your life is to focus on helping others get better. In 2 Kings 4, 5, it says, So she went from him and shut the door upon her and upon her sons who brought the vessels to her and she poured out. So pour yourself into other vessels. You see, all the stuff you have, material things you have, does not matter. It is people that matter. Don't spend all your time pouring yourself into things that are temporal. You're just pouring your life down the drain, pretty much, if you do that. Pour yourself into other people. You're filled with the Spirit. Now go around other Christians and help them get filled with the Spirit. Pour yourself into them. So she shut the door upon her and upon her sons. That's significant because getting alone with God can help you get filled up. Get alone with God and pray that your brothers and sisters in the Lord will get dedicated and filled up. In 2 Kings 4, 6, it says, And it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said unto her son, Bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, There is not a vessel more. And the oil stayed. So you want it to stick. You don't want it to be a, a fluke. You want the oil to stay. Then she came and told the man of God, and he said, Go, sell the oil, and pay thy debt, and live thou and thy children of the rest. So the Lord, this illustrates how the Lord will give you what you need to pay off your debt, and then give you some to live on as well. Jesus Christ paid off your debt and then gave you grace and mercy to live on. The creditor is coming. You reap what you sow. And if you don't want to be a bondman for the flesh, then get filled with the Spirit and spend your time pouring yourself into the people around you and help them get filled. And it pays off in this life and in the world to come. You see in 1 Timothy 4, 8, where it says, For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. So, the first point was make room for the Spirit. That was the first thing. You make room for the Holy Spirit. Now, the second thing, make room for the preacher. In Second Kings 4, 8, it says, And it fell on a day, 
that Elijah passed to Shunem, where was a great woman, and she constrained him to eat bread. And so it was that as oft as he passed by, he turned in thither to eat bread. Notice that phrase, it fell on a day. You see, everything that happens in your life fell on a day. There are only so many of those days. God started those days way back in Genesis, and he knows when the last one's going to be. He's the one that's got the hourglass. He can see how much is left to go to the bottom. Everything that happens in your life will fall on a day. Remember that. You only got so many days. Your days are numbered. But Elisha runs into a great woman, and a mark of a great woman is a love for hearing the words of the Lord. So she must have liked she must have loved the words of the Lord because she makes room for the preacher. She always made room for Elijah to come in and eat bread. It says in verse 9, And she said to her husband, Behold now, I perceive that this is an holy man of God which passeth by us continually. She knew the real preaching. She didn't take it for granted. She said, I perceive that this is an holy man of God. You know, if you've been listening, if you're saved and you've been listening to preaching for a while, then you can perceive if this guy has really got the goods or if he's just another money-hungry, fake TV preacher. You can tell. She knew the real preaching. She didn't take it for granted. And God had him passing by continually. You see, when you take good preaching and you appreciate it, God just keeps letting it pass by your way. I'm constantly finding another preacher that I just love that just does, says something or has a certain way of doing things that just, I guess, takes my, my studies to the next level, you could say, or changes the way my Christian walk is, the more I learn from him. And in 2 Kings 9... It says, And she said to her husband, Behold, now I perceive that this is an holy man of God, which passeth by us continually. And she says, Let us make a little chamber, I pray thee, on the wall, and let us set for him there a bed, and a table, and a stool, and a candlestick, and it shall be when he cometh to us that he shall turn in thither. So she makes room for the preacher in her home. She makes room. Do you hear the word of the Lord in your home? Or do you just only have to go somewhere else to hear it? We are living in a time where you can have daily preaching, just like you have daily prayer and daily Bible reading. We're living in that time. And it fell on a day that he came thither, and he turned into the chamber and lay there. And he said to Gehazi, his servant, Call this Shunammite. And when he had called her, she stood before him. And when the preaching calls you out, then stand. Don't fall back. She stood before him, and he said unto him, Say now unto her, Behold, thou hast been careful for us with all this care. What is to be done for thee? Wouldest thou be spoken for to the king or to the captain of the host? And she answered, I dwell among mine own people. You see, uh, he, he's complimenting her here. When the preaching compliments you, even when it compliments you, still remember where you came from and what you still are in the flesh. She wasn't trying to speak to any kings or captains. She was a nobody and knew she needed to stay a nobody. She wasn't trying to go meet a somebody. She was staying a nobody. Um, even when Elijah's preaching didn't show her how bad she was, she didn't let it get to her head. So when the preaching compliments you, sometimes your pastor will compliment you when he's preaching. Still remember where you came from and what you still are in the flesh. But you see, she's ready to hear. And he said, What then is to be done for her? And Gehazi answered, Verily she hath no child, and her husband is old. And he said, Call her. And when he had called her, she stood in the door. 
And he said, About this season, according to the time of life, thou shalt embrace a son. And she said, Nay, my Lord, thou man of God, do not lie unto thine handmaid. And the woman conceived and bare a son at that season that Elijah had said unto her, According to the time of life. You see, when the preaching says you need to have a child, go out and beget some people through the gospel. You see, you can have spiritual children. If you tell somebody the gospel and they get saved, that is your spiritual child in the Lord. The preacher told her to, she was going to have a child, to go out and have a child, and the woman conceived and bare a son. Don't just take it for granted when you have a pastor that tells you to go win someone to the Lord. Listen, be ready to hear. Go win somebody to the Lord. Have spiritual children. And that brings us to the next point. Make room. You already make room. You already made room for the Holy Spirit. Make room for the preaching. The third thing is make room for your children, your physical children. In Second Kings 4.18, And when the child was grown, it fell on a day that he went out to his father to the reapers. Once again, it fell on a day. There will be a day that your child or someone you love gets sick. There will be a day when someone you love dies. That day is coming. It might not be today, but it will fall on a day. And he said unto his father, My head, my head. And he said to a lad, Carry him to his mother. You see, usually the, he's, telling the, he's telling the guy here to uh, get the kid and take him to his mother. This is because usually the mother takes care of a sick and hurting child. But the father here could have made a little more room for the child. He could have been more hands-on. Uh, a lot of times fathers are bad about this. You need to make room for your children. Spend more time with them. Take more concern with them. It's not going to kill you to do that. And when he had taken him and brought him to his mother, he sat on her knees till noon and then died. You see, she made room for the child. Her heart was for her child. There are a lot of people that regret never making room for their child. And she went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God, and shut the door upon him and went out. So she's not giving up on her child. And you see, take him to the most godly people you know. And maybe a touch of that godly person will rub off on him. She's taking him and putting him in that little chamber that she made for Elisha. And it says in verse 22, And she called unto her husband and said, Send me, I pray thee, one of the young men and one of the asses, that I may run to the man of God and come again. You see, she, on, she knows the only hope for a dead son is to hear the word of the Lord. That's why she's going to the prophet. You see, you were, you were once dead in trespasses and sins, and you heard a preacher preach, and you passed from death to life after believing the gospel. You see, the only hope for a dead son is to hear the word of the Lord. And he said, Wherefore wilt thou go to him today? This is the uh, her husband, the, the boy's father speaking. He said in verse 23, Wherefore wilt thou go to him today? It is neither new moon nor Sabbath. He, and she said, It shall be well. So just like a lot of men today, they don't have a spiritual bone in their body. The father's like, it's not the Sabbath. What are you going to the preacher for? Whereas today, Sunday is considered the spiritual day instead of Saturday. And men will say to their wife, why are you reading your Bible today? It's not Sunday. It's not Wednesday, not Bible study. It's not Easter. It's not Christmas. Why are you doing this? You see, most men don't give God a thought. They may go to church with their wife on Sunday or something, but most of them won't even open their Bible. The lack of Bible-loving men is horrible. Uh, I've, I very rarely come in contact with people in the workplace or even anywhere that's a male that gives two flips about the Bible. They honestly do not care about the Bible. All they care about is hunting, fishing, sports, their job itself, anything but the Bible. They have no idea what the Bible says. I mean, they're, they're 50, 60, 70 years old. They've never read any of the Bible. 
Certainly never read it through. And it's just a shame. But it says, in verse 24, Then she saddled an ass and said to her servant, Drive and go forward. Slack not thy riding for me, except I bid thee. So she's on a mission to save her dead son. The plot of many movies and books. I mean, she's like, she got on that thing. She's like, drive, go forward, and go fast. Let's like not thy writing for me. You know, she's in a hurry to save a dead son. So she went and came into the man of God to Mount Carmel. And it came to pass when the man of God saw her afar off that he said to Gehazi his servant, Behold, yonder is the Shunammite. That's where country people, that's where country people get to saying over yonder. But it says, Run now, I pray thee, to meet her, and say unto her, Is it well with thee? Is it well with thy husband? Is it well with the child? And she answered, It is well. Things weren't really well in the sense her son is dead, but it's well in the sense that everything is okay when you're on the Lord's side. And when she came to the man of God to the hill, she caught him by the feet. But Gehazi came near to thrust her away, and the man of God said, Let her alone, for her soul is vexed within her, and the Lord hath hid it from me, and hath not told me. This shows you that unless the Lord shows you a thing, you aren't going to know it. And anything that you know about the Bible is because God allowed you to know it. Then she said, Did I desire a son of my Lord? Did I not say, Do not deceive me? You know, she's referring to the fact that she never even asked Elijah for her son, but he took it upon himself to give her one. And she thought from the start that it was too good to be true. And now her son's dead. She's thinking she's not going to even get to see him grow up and have children of his own. But it says, Then he said to Gehazi, Gird up thy loins, and take my staff in thine hand, and go thy way. If thou meet any man, salute him not. And if any salute thee, answer him not again. And lay my staff upon the face of the child. You see, um, so-called faith healers today, attempting this kind of thing today, they believe they've got the healing powers that maybe Elijah or Paul or the apostles had. They even believe they have some type of object like Elijah's, Elisha's staff that can heal men that touch it or like Paul's handkerchief or like Peter's shadow passing on people. They pretend to have these certain objects that can heal you if you touch them. But once again, those are fakes. They're not like Elijah. They're not like Paul. And even here, you're going to see that the staff doesn't do nothing. And the mother of the child said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And he arose and followed her. And Gehazi passed on before them and laid the staff upon the face of the child. But there was neither voice nor hearing. Wherefore he went again to meet him and told him, saying, The child is not awaked. So the staff didn't do the trick. It isn't really the object anyway. It's about the Lord. Notice what Paul's handkerchief could do. In Acts 19.12, it says, So that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs, or aprons, and the diseases parted from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. So if the Lord chooses to allow an object to be a part of healing somebody, it will. But really, it's the Lord that's doing it. And when Elijah was coming to the house, behold, the child was dead and laid upon his bed. He went in, therefore, and shut the door upon them twain, and prayed unto the Lord. And he went up, and lay upon the child, and put his mouth upon his mouth, and his eyes upon his eyes, and his hands upon his hands, and stretched himself upon the child, and the flesh of the child waxed warm. So this is artificial respiration. And if the preacher can get on fire in his chamber, that's where they are, and is, is in his little chamber, and then it pass on to you, then you can wax warm. Just like when you go to church, if you've got a good preacher and he was in his little chamber all week and and the message got on fire in him, he can pass it on to you and then you can wax warm. You can get more and more on fire for God. He can put his mouth upon your mouth and then you can start saying the right things. He can put his eyes on your eyes and give you the right type of vision. He can put his hands on your hands and teach your fingers to war and your hands to work. In 2 Kings 
435, it says, Then he returned and walked in the house to and fro. One of the only places where to and the phrase to and fro is not in a negative light. For example, the devil walks to and fro. And the raven that went out of the ark, he went to and fro. You know, most of the time to and fro is negative, but here it's not. And walked in the walked in the house to and fro, and went up and stretched himself upon him. And the child sneezed seven times, and the child opened his eyes. So when you sneeze, air and saliva and mucus are forced out of your nose and your mouth. And so the preacher got a bunch of nasty junk out of him, and seven times because seven is the number of perfection. <clears throat> If you get close enough to the preacher, he'll rub off on you and all that nasty junk will come off. And I mean a, a good Bible-believing preacher, not the fake ones on TV. And he called Gehazi and said, Call the Shunammite. So he called her, and when she was coming into him, he said, Take up thy son. Then she went in and fell at his feet and bowed herself to the ground and took up her son and went out. So the woman made time for her child. She wouldn't give up. She knew who to go to. She knew only the Lord could bring someone back from the dead. Just like he's the only one who can bring your, your child back from the dead, spiritually speaking. So that's make room for the Holy Ghost. Make room for your child. Make room for the preacher. Now the last one, make room for the word. In Second Kings 4.38, it says, And Elisha came again to Gilgal, and there was a dearth in the land. Uh, and the sons of the prophets were sitting before him. And he said unto his servant, Set on the great pot, and seeth pottage for the sons of the prophets. So there is a dearth in the land. Just like today in our country, you have a self-inflicted famine. In Amos 8.11 it says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land. Not a famine of bread, nor a thirst of water, but of hearing. The words of the Lord. You see, I mean that's not that verse isn't talking about America, but I'm just using it for an illustration here. What you have in our land is a self inflicted famine. There are Bibles everywhere, the word the word of God's everywhere, you got twenty four seven access to the word, but nobody's reading it. Nobody's eating the words. Uh imagine if People were starving to death, and they had a refrigerator full of food and a pantry full of food, and they would not get into the food in the refrigerator and in the pantry, and they just died. That's kind of like what it's like with them in the Bible. They got 24-7 access to the Bible, but they just won't open the book and read it. So it's a self-inflicted famine, in a way, that we got going on. Verse 39 and 40, And one went out into the field to gather herbs, and found a wild vine, and gathered thereof wild gourds his lap full, and came and shred them into the pot of pottage, for they knew them not. So they poured out for the men to eat, and it came to pass as they were eating of the pottage, that they cried out and said, O thou man of God, there is death in the pot. And they could not eat thereof. So this guy done went out and found a wild vine, and took the wild gourds and shred them into the pot of pottage. Not only is there a famine in the land because people are neglecting the word today, but there's also one because someone keeps messing with the Bible. You see, they're like this guy that, that found that wild vine. And they're, they're inserting their own opinion. They're taken away from it, taking verses away adding stuff to it that shouldn't be there. They put their two cents in it about how they believe the Bible should be written. When your pastor prepares a sermon, it's like cooking a meal for you. And many pastors are throwing in some death in the pot by making their congregation think that there are errors in the Bible. He's throwing errors into the Bible, coming up with errors out of thin air. <clears throat> Verse 41, but he said, then bring meal. And he cast it into the pot and he said, pour out for the people that they may eat. And there was no harm in the pot. So Elijah tells them to bring meal. 
Elijah's idea of cooking a meal involves putting meal in the pot. And that can picture the Word of God. The best preaching involves a lot of the Word of God. It is done by people who believe what it says, not by the people who's trying to throw in the deadly stuff. And there came a man from Belshalisha and brought the man of God bread of the first fruits, twenty loaves of barley, and full ears of corn in the husk thereof. And he said, Give unto the people that they may eat. And his servitor said, What should I set this before a hundred men? He said again, Give the people that they may eat, for thus saith the Lord, They shall eat and shall leave thereof. So that means they shall eat and have some leftovers. They're going to need a to-go box. They're thinking that it's not going to be enough. But once again, he's multiplying stuff just like the Lord multiplies stuff. So they're going to eat and have some leftovers. They're going to need a doggy bag. And the best preaching is... Um, the best preaching is good preaching whether there is one man or there are a hundred men there. It will feed them just the same. Whether there's one man there or a hundred men there. Good preaching will fill them just the same. The, and, and the best preaching gets you thinking while you're there and then gives you enough notes for your to-go box. And if you don't take notes, it ought to jam your mind full of stuff to think about for a while. So much that you don't just think about it while you're there. You got it in your to-go box, and you took it with you. My favorite sermons or lessons that get me so filled up where I had to take tons of notes and get so full that I had to go back over it later because it was too much to take it all in at once. Kind of like, you know, you go to a good restaurant that gives you big portions. It's really good, and you eat a lot there. But uh, you have to get it to go box and take it home with you. You just can't stomach it all at that time. That's uh, that's the way I like the preaching and the teaching. I like it to just get me full while I'm there. And then I got all these notes or all this stuff in my mind that it made me think about to the point I needed a, a to go box. And then I'm going over it at home that night and maybe even into the next couple days. You know, on the fourth on the fourth day, surely I've got it eight. But Elijah said they shall eat and leave thereof. So he set it before them, and they did eat and left thereof, according to the word of the Lord. What Elijah said came to pass, because he's a real prophet.